start with me. Um, the obligatory about slides. Um, I'm a husband, father, grandfather. Anybody wants to see new baby pictures, I've got them four days old. Um, I've been talking VoIP security here at Astrakhan since Denver, 2011. So uh, we try to scare people so they will actually get their act together and stop letting people do horrible things to them. Um, involved with various startups, helping them, advising them, making it go. Have a book that came out in March called The One. You <laughs> and several fans in the audience and have copies if anybody's interested. Would you come to present yourself? Okay. <laughs> I can't do you justice. <laughs> uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. I took inspiration from Eric's uh, first bullet about being a husband and father. So, you know, I, I don't have any kids, but I do have two cats. So. Cat daddy is the, is the new thing. <laughs> um, I love solving problems, um, even if it's uh, you know, in the areas of fraud prevention, which is what I did uh, on my previous wallet at Forder. Um, and today we're going to talk about the actual types of uh, uh, fraud attacks that take place um, both on the telecom <coughs> part of, uh, of, of the um, uh, phone uh, systems, but also about uh, what happens um, when you use a company's call center to um, actually go ahead and uh, um, implement other methods of fraud. Uh, and back to you, Eric, for now. OK. Um, <laughs> ju just as a, a, a shameless plug, Dovid, who is walking over to sit down now, We'll be talking technical issues later on how to prevent fraud and what you can do in your PBX. But uh, Dovid's not paying attention to me, so it doesn't matter. Um, I'm plugging your talk. Pay attention. OK. Let's start with the obvious. Why do you need to protect yourself? Like I said, he'll tell you how. I've done that for the last several years. I'm skipping that this time. Over the last several years, the computer fraud um, the CFCA has done an annual, uh, every other year does a survey of what kind of fraud or what the cost is to the telecom industry. So you go back to 2008, it was an industry that was worth $1.7 trillion, 60 billion of that was lost to fraud. And over the years, the numbers have been slowly going down because of people like us who go out there and say, wait a second, why are they doing this? Why are we letting them get away with it? So last year, it was down to $29.2 billion worth of telecom fraud. Okay? This is not small change. Okay? I don't think anybody in the room would turn down 10% of that number um, just as an investment in whatever they're doing. Um, so this is a big concern, and it's a big problem. But let's look at it a little more specifically. In the last survey, which came out last November 2017, these were the top 10 fraud method, okay? Identity fraud, subscription fraud, isn't a direct problem for us here, but PBX and IP PBX hacking are the next two biggest thing for just under, um, was that, just under $4 billion lost to PBX hacking. Everybody in this room is some way involved with PBX or you wouldn't be at Astrakhan. These are your customers that are getting hit. Okay, some of the other ones, and we'll get down to it later, some of the discussions, the phishing, farming, payment fraud, um, these are the kinds of things that Orr and I are going to be talking about today. Not how to protect your PBX. You have two choices, find Dovid's presentation later, or what we've talked about in previous Astrakhan's. Um, those have ranged from $25,000 hits to, we had one guy who said that they were hit for $400,000 in two days. Um, Somebody put an asterisk PBX into their server room, didn't give him the password, so it wasn't updated for two years. They found an exploit and nailed him for that. So these are things that we need to be concerned with. Okay? Obvious problems are, where are they sending the fraud? How are they doing it? It's a lot of premium rate fraud, call forwarding fraud. And what you find out is people are sending calls to expensive countries where they're doing revenue shares with the carriers there standard 900 number kind of services here. Um, 
How many of your customers actually have business that sends calls to Cuba on a regular basis? Or Latvia, or Lith uh, Lithuania? Okay, UK is more regular, but I mean, the average small business that only does things locally doesn't have a need to make international calls. So these are things to be paying attention to. Okay? So in 2015, the top countries were Cuba, Somalia, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, it's now changed. It's still Cuba, but it's Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, Bosnia fell down uh, significantly in the list of where the targets were. Okay? Big problem these days, and uh, this is directly related to some of the things that we'll be talking about. There are a lot of attacks going on regularly using SIP. Okay? Uh, last time I was presenting two years ago, I actually showed a SIP attack where they're basically using a uh, dictionary and they're taking standard extension numbers and they're hitting them with a dictionary of 2,500 standard passwords, password, call center, et cetera, just trying to hack into people's extensions. Okay? And you'll see the numbers go up and down, um, but the overall trend is since 2015 and 2016, the numbers continue going up. More people are putting out Asterix, FreePBX, all of these other open source projects. Some of them are buying them in Costco as little home uh, PBXs for 20 bucks that have it. And they all have standard passwords that nobody ever changes. Um, so I'm not going to get into some of that now. But the big thing that they're doing is denial of service attacks. And I will let Aura go into a lot more detail as to why, but the basic idea if you are doing a SIP denial of service attack, the PBX or the phone cannot receive calls for verification. And this is part of his talk, so I'm not going to go into any more detail than this. Okay? But the methods that they're using is interesting. Call flooding, message flooding, okay? Malformed messages where they're sending bad SIP commands or SIP invites to people, which ties up the server. Okay? The thing is, it's getting to the point where standard cell phones are being used for these attacks. You download an app that you think is an authentic one, turns out that it's a bad clone, and now your cell phone is making illegal calls, blocking somebody else, or just making international calls on your plan, and you don't know it. Okay? So you really need to start paying attention to this because they arrive and their targets, there are ways to see how they're going, and there are standard methods that are going that you should be looking at and blocking. Okay, again, I'm going to just put this up now. Why are they doing it? They're doing it to extort money, okay? If you can't get phone calls into your business, your business dies. So they're doing it and they're basically using blackmail. Send us two bitcoins and we'll stop uh, attacking. There are actually services out there that will protect you or can be used to pay to attack you. And it's the same company doing both the protecting and the attacking. Okay, these are fairly common things. We discussed these back in 2015 in Atlanta. Look at the YouTube clips, the, the kinds of things that people are doing and what's happening haven't changed all that much. They're just finding more and more targets. Okay. Credit card fraud. This is your side. Sorry, we're doing tag team the, the, the hard way this time. <coughs> Okay, so thank you. <laughs> um, what I'm going to talk about um, is the other side of uh, what Eric described, and that's how you use telecom in order to commit credit card fraud, which is uh, a whole different story. While SIP attacks are, uh, and you know, making calls to premium rates, etc., are valid. Uh, attack vectors, and this is something that happens a lot. Uh, fraudsters advance, and they found ways to utilize uh, legitimate VoIP services, etc., to commit credit card fraud. And we'll cover it end to end. I'll try to do it in uh, five to ten minutes. Um, but the first thing that I want to go over and, and ignore the scary slide <laughs> is how credit card transaction works. And basically, when you make a credit card transaction, um, your bank is uh, taking money from your account and forwarding it to a different bank, uh, which is the business's bank, the merchant's bank. 
And the, one of the most important things here, uh, that process is reversible. Unlike um, fraudulent calls made to premium, uh, premium rate numbers, uh, where the money is uh, paid to the carrier that uh, received the call anyway, on credit card fraud, it's reversible. The client can basically deny and say, I didn't do that transaction, I didn't make it. And the client will get the money back from the bank. And who usually suffers from it is the business who tries to charge the card but end up uh, have to give the money back to the actual client. Um, there are few methods, uh, I'm sorry, few types of fraud. Uh, there's the classic fraud where you know, a fraudster or a group of uh, hackers will gain access to a large list of credit card numbers and will try to use them uh, and basically extract as much money as possible from all these credit cards and then stuff it into their pockets. Uh, but there are also uh, two other types of fraud. The friendly fraud, which is basically when, I don't know, uh, your kid buys apps from the Apple App Store or the Play Store uh, for $100. And then you look at the statement and you don't understand why you had to pay to Google uh, or Apple all that money. And then you call the credit card company and tell them, listen, I, I didn't buy those apps. You'll get your money back and Google will have to return it. But this is not an actual fraud. This is, you know, mostly a misunderstanding. And the most, I think, sophisticated uh, and, and complex method of fraud these days is the account takeover, ATO, uh, when basically a fraudster just actually gains access to your actual account. So, you know, let's say you have a mailbox in Yahoo and the fraudster gains access to that mailbox. Uh, the fraudster is basically able to unlock any service that you use the Yahoo mailbox to register to. Um, and the problem with that is that uh, usually accounts have stored payment methods in them. Okay, so if you're using Uber, you uh, at some point created an account using either your email or your phone number and if one of those were compromised, a fraudster can gain access to your Uber account and then make rides uh, charging your credit card for them. And these are things that actually happen uh, today um, in everywhere in the world, but uh, it happens in the US and it also happens in uh, Eastern Europe. I think that's where the most sophisticated account takeover attacks takes place. Um, just to put uh, a number to the problem. Uh, account takeover costs uh, the industry about uh, $3.3 billion a year. Uh, that's out of 60, almost $60 billion um, of credit card fraud. And most of the transactions that are high amount, um, I'm sorry, transactions that are higher amount, uh, let's say $500 and more, are automatically more dangerous. They're actually 11 times uh, more dangerous than uh, transactions that are uh, $100 or less. So, you know, if you're buying uh, flight tickets uh, from an airline, your transaction is most likely over $500. Uh, dollars. That means that 11% of uh, the airline tickets bought are fraudulent. Um, sorry. Uh, are using um, the stolen credit card details. And part of the, the thing that I want to cover is, uh, and this is important because you have the power to m take this information and pass it along to your customers, okay? One of the things I encountered was that uh, call center representatives had no idea that caller ID can be faked, okay? That, that, that was my first response. Everybody in this room knows that caller ID means nothing. And I ran into a group of, um, uh, of analysts that were in charge of you know, approving uh, or declining legitimate or non-legitimate transactions. And I told them, listen, when you get a phone call from a customer, even though it shows their caller ID, that doesn't mean that's the actual caller ID. And everybody went insane. They were like, what? What do you mean it can be faked? Uh, we, we trust caller ID like, you know, like it's the same as receiving an email. And, you know, 
the, the, the only way to explain it is unless you made the call to the phone number or you sent the email and the other side received it, there's no way of telling that the other side actually owns it. Email address can be faked and caller ID can be faked. And one of the problems that this is creating is it basically uh, gives bad name to telecom providers and VoIP in general. Uh, if you try to open an account uh, in Lyft service and you're using a VoIP number, uh, Lyft will simply decline your business. It doesn't matter if, you, if your use case is legitimate, it doesn't matter if you know, your office uh, uses Twilio numbers or uh, whatever DAD provider. Uh, once they know that the phone number is from a VoIP provider, they'll simply won't let you open an account. And that's one problem. But the other problem is that, again, people don't know that caller ID can be faked and email address can be faked. And you end up with uh, types of account takeover, such as a person would call. Um, this is a true story. I can't uh, name the company. But uh, we had a case, multiple cases, where uh, somebody got a hold of um, a list of email addresses. Um, there was a leak uh, of about 50,000 uh, US email addresses verified with passwords. And that person uh, targeted a specific electronics retailer. And that retailer's website gave away whether an email address has an account on the service or not. So if you went to the a password reset page and you'll type in an email address, uh, it will tell you the email does not exist or we sent you a verification email and that was um, you know, uh, conclusive. So what that person did is out of these 50,000 email addresses, uh, he was able to nail down 200 email addresses that actually had an account in this large uh, retailer. And then gradually what he did, he would um, basically find the person's name or phone number and make a call to that retailer's call center from the person's caller ID, the actual phone number, and would say, listen, uh, I'm locked out of my account. I can't access my email address. Can you please change my account's email to be the new email address? And then he would give them, you know, if my name is Orpolchek, then he'll give them uh, orpolchek23 at gmail.com as the new email address. And the call center uh, played along. And once that person was able to gain access for a few accounts, some of them had the stored credit card information within the account. And that person basically cleaned that retailer uh, from about uh, $12,000 worth of electronics within two weeks. So by the time that you know, customers started denying that they've ever made those credit card transactions, that person had uh, utilized the two days free shipping for orders above $1,000. He had all that electronics at his house, you know, moved on to the next victim. So uh, what that resulted um, was what I call the API's spring. And that's basically all those services that you know, sell you uh, VoIP numbers or DADs would start offering a method to know whether the numbers you are looking at are uh, connected to their service or not. So Twilio offers uh, an API called Lookup, which basically tells you this number is a VoIP and it's connected to Twilio's service or uh, it's uh, not a real number. Um, whatever uh, you know, having access to an HLR gives you, basically. Uh, what's the carrier and what's the country that this number is associated with and connected to. And it's, I mean, it's one way to, to try and at least address that part of the problem. But again, as I said, uh, it's sometimes uh, used the wrong way, like with Lyft, where they won't let you open an account in the service. Uh, some of the other interesting attacks we've seen. And again, this everything here happen, happens over the phone because basically gaining access to a mailbox is harder than just faking your caller ID and calling and fooling another person on the other side. So uh, we've seen cases where uh, a person would make uh, an order uh, with a stolen credit card. 
uh, of a specific person, and that Fordster would order products to the person's real address. Okay, so if someone stole my wallet and made uh, performed orders to my actual home address, uh, usually they're gonna go through because you know if if the if the retailer or whatever store that sells online uses a fraud prevention service, you know they they have historical data. They are saying, okay, this is Or's real address. They know that it's my real address, so they'll let the order go. And then what fraudsters will do is they'll call uh, UPS or FedEx from my caller ID and just tell them, uh, listen, I won't be at home. Any chance you can uh, hold it at the FedEx location or any way you can change the address and send it over to uh, a hotel, um, you know, uh, 20 miles away. And, you know, th this is just another way of actually being successful at stealing products, etc. Um, and there, seriously, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, there, there's, there was a case where a um, few people set up a fake travel agency. They just uh, bought phone numbers, built a website. They have people call them. And what they'll do is they'll sell you an actual airline ticket. They'll, um, they'll actually buy the ticket for you at uh, the airline's website. You will receive the ticket to your email. And after the transaction was successful, they'll cancel your ticket. And once the airline releases the funds, they'll just make a fraudulent credit card transaction on a different website using your credit card. But they already have your information because you bought something from them. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, the point is that you, I, I think personally what you can do is first attend uh, David's uh, talk later a bit, you know, in order to learn how to uh, protect yourself from the technical aspects of, of telecom fraud and fraud in general. But the other thing is all that knowledge that you keep in your head about, you know, not trusting uh, caller IDs not trusting incoming email addresses, etc. Try and take all these methods and think how can you pay it forward to your uh, call center representatives and you know people that you are in touch with. Uh, so they'll at least be more familiar with that because it, it's all all the things in this list are a matter of policy. Uh, so you know if when you ship a product using FedEx, you'll tell them that no matter what, they're not allowed to reroute the package that solves that specific part of the problem, right? So it's, it's relatively easy to address these specific things. Um, and I'll head it back over to Eric to continue on what's new. News. What's news? Okay. okay, can you hear me again? Good. Okay. One of the things that I like to put into these uh, talks is some practical examples of what's happened in the last year or so. Okay, so a couple of unusual attacks. They're not all hack, in this particular case, there were fewer hack attacks that I could find documented than actual use of uh, phone kind of problems. Okay, I apologize, the slides have a lot of words because they're gonna get posted on the website later and I'm not gonna be there to explain them. Um, there are a lot of people who come to the United States to study who come from Taiwan. There are not a lot of places they can go. They come here, they study in university, and they've been getting hit with fraudulent calls from people pretending to be from the Chinese embassy, accusing them of various crimes, and basically saying, we need you to deposit money so we know that you will actually show up at court. And these deposits, in one case, hit somebody for $180,000, where they went and they cleaned out the person's bank account. Okay, happening an awful lot lately to this particular subset. Why it's specifically Taiwanese? The Chinese really don't like them and want to screw them over wherever they can. Okay? So, there's been a problem lately where people hacking systems and setting up unconditional call forwarding. Okay? So there was one case uh, where somebody went and did 1,700 call attempts to calls in 17 different countries. Okay, in this particular case, the list of countries, and this one was done um, 
through, I believe it was um, Pindrop uh, provided this information. They were actually able to block it because these were not normal destinations for calls, so they were able to block the calls. But you can see the list of countries, okay? Canada, U.S. is normal, okay? But you get to Jamaica, Barbados, St. Lucia, um, and it goes down the list of fraudulent calls that were basically looked at and say, wait, the call rate on this call is not permitted for this particular user. Um, so these are things that you need to be looking at. Again, where are the calls going? Should they be happening? Okay. It is now estimated that at least half of all cell phone calls next year will be fraudulent. Okay. The number has gone up from 3.7% in 2017, just under 30% this year, and expected to go up to 44.6% of all cellular calls are, going to be con are probably going to be fraudulent calls uh, and this was based on s analyzing 50 billion calls over 18 months. They are starting to play with cell phones in all sorts of ways, uh, fraudulent apps, fraudulent services. Remember, effectively, this is a little PPX in your pocket. Call forwarding, call bridging, everything can be done remotely hacked into here. And once they've got that, they can make calls and you'd never see it until the bill comes. Okay. And this one was kind of interesting. There was a case of insider fraud, okay, $61,000 over a week, where they basically were taking, arrested somebody who worked for BSNL as an engineer and a solution provider that they were working with. They had taken a school's PRI line. Yes, people are still using PRI out there. Um, literally took the line and did a redirect uh, and over a uh, seven month period, we're getting $61,000 in fraudulent calls that they were collecting cash on. Okay? And this one is my all time favorite. Okay? Happened about two weeks ago at the Ki Kai Ola Marine Mammal Center in Hawaii. Specifically, a hospital that deals with seals, otters, whales, dolphins, that kind of thing. The director was getting upset because somebody at the, ho at the hospital kept calling her, but there was no sound. Nobody on the line. So she sent out onto the internal um, message and sent out onto Twitter, what's going on? And suddenly they're finding out that there are a lot of people who are coming back to the hospital going, why are you calling us? Why am I getting dead air calls from you guys? So they went to Hawaii Telecom. Okay? They actually went and checked. And confirmed that there were legitimately what they refer to as a bazillion calls. I didn't know people actually use that word except in the Big Bang Theory. Um, and they were coming from a single line, a single extension in the hospital. So they went and they hunted down this particular line and extension. And when they found it, it wasn't a hack, it wasn't hardware or software, but what they referred to as footwear. And you're all wondering, what does footwear have to do with fraud? Okay. They found the toe pads of a gold dust day gecko. Little lizard about this big. Was not a patient at the hospital, but had snuck in through a window and was walking up and down the phone, dialing constantly because it was looking for bugs. So it would get up to someplace high, climb up, look for flies, climb back down, climb up, and happening all the time. So this is what the little culprit looked like. Somebody at the Hawaiian Telecom proceeded to go, wait a second, you're a marine, a marine mammal. That's not a marine animal. It's not even a mammal. So it's like, okay. People are running into all sorts of weird problems that aren't necessary. They're not legitimate calls, but as far as the phone company is concerned, they are. Okay? There have been some interesting law changes. Do you want to cover this one real quick or? That's my workout for today, going up in the... <laughs> Step counts. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, know Your Customer is an, uh, KYC, is um, an existing regulation that uh, uh, is from the uh, discipline of um, anti-money laundering. And what happened is that the European Union uh, adopted that, uh, that specific term and generated a regulation that's basically says that starting from 2019, every 
transaction that has a financial aspect um, has to be uh, has to be made when you know for sure that the other party is your customer. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I don't think that they were even even able to um, break it down. Uh, uh, in the um, uh, the way that they they described it in in the the actual laws, but what they basically what they say is that um, if you are a credit card company or a bank or if you are a retailer on the other side or a merchant whatever phone company etc every time that you try to charge your customer uh, and get money from them you have to make sure that it is the actual customer on the other side. How you do that, we don't care. That, that, that's basically what they say. So, uh, you know, things like multi-factor authentication, sending an SMS to the customer and uh, having the customer <coughs> type uh, back the few digits code, uh, that's one part of it, but um, it's not enough. Uh, the regulations now change, and uh, I don't think anybody has a clue how they're going to address that. I mean, how can you make sure that the person on the other side is making the transaction other than physically uh, seeing them, right? Having a, a, a visual verification of some sort, uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, also in the payment industry, they are now changing uh, what's called uh, 3DS, 3D Secure, uh, which is something you might have encountered when uh, making online transactions, uh, where you get this weird screen from your bank saying, uh, listen, type this, uh, uh, 16-digit uh, code from your last uh, credit card statement or just sending you an SMS, but this is a page that you see that is powered by your bank when you're making a transaction at the third parties. Um, so all these regulations of actually verifying that the other side of the transaction is the credit card owner or, uh, you know, perhaps now that you have mobile payments, then the phone line holder uh, is getting more and more complicated and uh, started to be enforced. Uh, and I believe it will get to the U.S. at some point, the same way that uh, using the uh, credit card chips got here, uh, still getting here, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the major law change that uh, happened uh, earlier this year <coughs> and is going to start taking place next year. And I think there is, you know, a place to think about how can you contribute into that, uh, you know, it, it's the same as uh, the GDPR blossom that we had uh, le uh, earlier this year. These things become mandatory and uh, customers around, uh, out there need your help in implementing those regulations and, you know, making sure that they're doing things the right way. Okay. Recent court case in Minnesota. They discovered the Minnesota State Legislature wanted to start charging VoIP providers for all of the rural services and special service fees that they charge traditional telecom. They said that they're not allowed to regulate it. So you now have no net neutrality and no ability to regulate VoIP, which now means Comcast or anybody else who offers their own voice services could potentially start playing games with the voice traffic. You need to start paying attention to this and your customers' problems, seeing if they're specific carrier or otherwise, because the states can't touch it. Okay, so this is something that happened just um, last month. It happened in the middle of September. Okay, and needless to say, the head of the FCC says that this is going to be proof that the new net neutrality laws getting thrown out and states can't regulate are going to be upheld. I don't quite buy that, but there's definitely a problem here. We need to start watching um, priority traffic, priority services, because these are becoming problems that are going to happen. And since all of the carriers uh, these days have some sort of a VoIP or voice service, they are potentially going to start putting roadblocks uh, and speed bumps in for those of us who are doing pure VoIP. So it's something to keep uh, an eye on. How many of you deal with bots? Only one? Wow. I'm truly surprised. California now has a new law that says as of July, bots actually have to tell people that they're not human. 
You can still use a bot. But if it's trying to sell somebody or trying to offer services, it actually has to make sure the person knows, and it can't be in the fine print. It actually has to be there that the person knows that they're not talking to a human being. This is, again, something that will be affecting more of us as we find voice bots, text bots slowly moving into there. Um, Google Voice and all these others are putting in the ability to do AI bots with voice. Uh, Google did a lovely demonstration of making a, um, I think it was a hairdresser's appointment. And, okay, admittedly, Google faked that entire thing. It, it wasn't really a phone call, it was a laboratory test that they showed. But the fact that they can show that, now they actually have to say, hi, this is the Google bot for, and give your name, and explain what's going on so they understand that it's really not a person on the line. Okay? Which, as far as I'm concerned, kind of defeat some of the purpose, but I understand after all of the Ashley Madison problems that they had a year or so ago, why they turned out this law. When you've got 200,000 customers and all of them are talking to the same bot under a different name, uh, and those are your paying customers, it's definitely a reason why people are freaking out. Okay. Um, other things to mention which I didn't put in. Uh, I know there was a talk here about GDPR, which is one of those really weird, scary things for all of us who do business that touches Europe, okay? When and how you store CDRs are re mandated by law, so a lot of us have one of those loopholes that says, I'm required to do this, and this is how long I have to maintain it, but you actually have to pay attention what the retention laws are and what needs to be done if you're doing calls that, that you can eventually get slapped with a subpoena for. GDPR is kind of fuzzy, and I'm still waiting to see who's going to get nailed with the fine first this year. Is it going to be Facebook or Google? Okay, because both of them have had major hits during the period and didn't do the proper things. Um, related to what Orr was talking about earlier with the Know Your Customer, uh, a couple years ago England went in and instituted a law related to financial transactions. You have to have them recorded not once, but twice. Once at the headquarters of the company, once in the geographic region of the customer. Every voice message, every fax, every SMS related to anything financial, banks, insurance, stockbrokers, everything has to be recorded, so you actually have to have systems to record it in two places. Pay attention to the laws they are changing. It's kind of funky. Any questions? The gentleman with the mic will come back to you now. I've, uh, I've just got a, let me exploit your knowledge of fraudulent calls question. Uh, it's very unremarkable. We have a toll-free number that falls on a, um, on a pretty good decimal boundary, old 800 number. Every day we get at least five to ten calls from a nearby rate center in Georgia where we're located. And when we pick them up, either silence or tones of some kind. You want to that's, that all, one? that's all we get. Uh, there never seems to be a human there. The numbers do not seem to be legitimate. Uh, but never has... Uh, they're, not, they're not expensive destinations. Um, okay. Nir, actually, Nir Simeonovich, uh, Eric's colleague, posted, uh, posted a blog post this morning exactly about that, uh, about that specific uh, thing. Uh, from <coughs> what he's saying, uh, this is, um, these are fraudulent calls, basically. Um, and it's done in some kind of uh, crawler form, where the, you have dialers that just go over all the 800 numbers, just dial, leave the line open for a few minutes, and then hang up the call. And we, we had a, a, you know, a small talk about it uh, yesterday. We're not sure if it's, um, you know, a way for the carrier to maximize the revenue uh, from some sort, or um, one possible way that this could be an actual attack is, you know, let's say that um, uh, I can go to one of the um, uh, telecom providers and tell them, listen, I can generate calls to 800 numbers. Um, all day long. These are the only calls that they make, uh, and let's have some kind of uh, you know rev share on these calls that I'll be making. You'll get most of the uh, payment, and I'll get some 
and you know, then they're just generating all these calls to whatever 800 numbers they can mm -hmm. find. Okay. Uh, in the past, I've seen this has also been a cor sign of corporate espionage or, or attack, where your competitor or somebody for your competitor is, is slowly sucking cash out of you and, and blocking your phone lines. It's, it's sort of partially a denial of service in that case, because you only have so many lines for that. Um, you wanted to add something, David? I wanted to add to what Or actually said. So what, what they're doing is, is they're trying to find phone numbers that, um, that will go to an IVR and will keep it open. <clears throat> say for a couple of hours, so they may, they, they're constantly changing the call already and they are obviously spoofing it so that, that, they, that you can't get back to them, but once they find a phone number that's actually going to an IVR, and that's why they're doing DTMF to see if it goes anywhere, if they to keep the line open, which is why a good idea if you have an IVR, totally loop it two, three times, and if there's no response, hang up, because if it's a human being and they couldn't press something fast enough, they'll hang up and they'll call back. So they're doing some very basic tests. And then we'll do, like our said is, they'll have an agreement with the carrier Well, they'll do calls, say from Hawaii, mm -hmm. where they're getting paid eight, nine, 10 cents a minute. For every single minute, you're paying 10, 15 cents a minute. They're laughing all the way to the bank. So they're actually just going ahead and looking for numbers that they could go ahead and exploit to make exactly what they're doing to make money on, and there's nothing stopping them. And then they said the, the phone companies are liking it as well. As much as they come out and say they hate the fraud, you know, if they're charging you 15 cents a minute, they're paying the fraudsters five cents a minute. They're making five cents a minute, and they're enjoying every single second of it. So it's exactly what's happening. It's 100% fraud. The other side of that is they're sending DTMF, so they are looking for that dial nine for outbound calls and stuff. Because if they find that you've got a, a, a 800 number that they can call into and then get an outside line off of, suddenly you're now their carrier. So th th this is something, it's kind of a, a 1990s attack where they used to call in and, and ask for... Um, Please, I need extension 9 something, 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 and it would give them an outside line because dial 9 for an outside line. Um, so just, just two things on that. One, the tones don't sound like DTMF. They could be, but they don't sound like DTMF to my ear. The second is the Annie's are regular bl number blocks in Augusta, Georgia mainly. They're not Hawaii or Guam. or No, but something. they, they could be spoofed. Um, but yeah, there, there are all sorts of problems. Like I said, it could just be a, a denial of service kind of attack or people that are just poking to see what they can find. Uh, on the fraud destinations, um, uh, my experience with compromise systems and attempts to compromise systems have all been Global Star and the Caribbean and not any of those countries. But you, okay. don't, you didn't even have Global Star listed there. So... The CFCA study, okay, Jamaica is the Caribbean. Um, the rest of it isn't. The one from Pindrop. Okay, whoops, where's that slide? Come on, that's weird. Ah, this one. Okay, so here you're looking at um, Trinidad, Antigua, Dominican, British Virgin Islands. So all of these were attempted calls. So yeah, there are, they're not as big. Um, the calls to the um, 801 trying to get people to make calls to there, which are international, not toll-free numbers in the U.S. and stuff, has come down a lot as people have learned, but it's still a legitimate problem. No, sat phones, uh, sat phones are, not, are not enough traffic now that anybody's really using them. Uh, going back to the gentleman that was talking about the silence calls, we've seen a lot of that where they're using your PBX as a relay. So another PBX in your area code has been hacked. They're relaying through you trying to go international or bouncing somewhere else to distract carriers. We see that a lot. We also have seen um, quite a bit where um, calls will come in. They'll play DTMF star star, which is, of course, a tenant transfer. Um, and so they'll play that to your IVR because it runs in your IVR if you haven't disabled that and you're running free PBX, you're in trouble. Um, so there's a ton of that stuff where you'll get silence and then a lot also like you're mentioning that where the IVRs will just play for 100 minutes yeah. until you get a silence disconnect and sure. they'll rake up 800 number bills. Thank you. In the far back. Okay. So I, I'm sorry I missed most of the presentation. I had a meeting. Um, I hope you, if maybe you cover this. We just had a hack um, recently where um, it was country code 37, which is Latvia, and it was 21, Morocco. 
And they were calling, and it was an Ottawa, Ottawa attendant just playing over and over again. They were just chew, chewing up minutes. And um, I read about some premium companies that sell premium numbers, and they split the revenue with the hacker. Is that kind of how it usually is done? Yeah, that's what, what you'll do. Is it's almost always they'll get a, a premium number, and they get a 50 50, 60 40 split. Sure, okay. With them. And they get paid weekly okay. or something and like that. And like you yeah. see, in 2017, Latvia was the second most popular destination yep. for these. So here's the question. One article I read that was in the New York Times a few years ago had a great solution, which is that we refuse to pay. We've encouraged our carrier to refuse to pay the upline carrier and so on and so forth until a couple lines up until, and in fact, I, I listened to every recording that was made on my customer systems and every single one except one where they were speaking in Arabic, I believe, and I'm trying to find a translator to find out what they were talking about with each other. Other than that, every one was that stupid auto attendant. So clearly there was a fraud calls. Can't that get pushed up the line and everyone refuses to pay until the problem goes away? Is that possible? Contractually, probably not. Because you're con if the call is coming and hitting your PBX, you are contractually obligated to pay it. Um, when we were at Astrocon 2011, there was the one case I've heard where somebody's actually fought it. Um, a cabinet maker in England was hit with 30,000 pounds worth of fraud over a weekend, literally while we were at Astrocon. And he's the only one I have found that has ever actually beaten it because the way the contract was written, he had used all the best practices to prevent it, had done everything required by contract, and they couldn't, the carrier couldn't force him to pay. And basically, they, the carrier ends up with the point of, I'm cutting you off until you pay and taking the risk of losing you as a customer and then suing you for the cash. And a lot of the little carriers will eat it. Um, the big ones will take you to court and, and nail you for 1000 bucks. Fine, it cost me five grand to, to do it, but I'm not going to let you get away with it. So there's no international or other accountability for this? No one is, is, is going after these guys? CFCA tries to. Um, there was a case where they were doing it a couple years ago. Al-Qaeda was doing it through call, uh, call centers in Italy against companies predominantly around Washington State for about $2 million. Uh, AT&T got the FCA, uh, FBI involved, and eventually they were able to break it. Okay. But otherwise, no. They, they're, they're trying, but nobody's really got that. Thank you. Okay, there was one in the far back. I was going to give you exactly what happened. Um, I've done the forensics on three of, the, uh, three of these that ended up in fifteen dollars to $20,000 range. Uh, one was all Global Star overnight. Um, the calls went through simple signal. Uh, the customer uh, had put IP phones with no passwords on real IP addresses and someone <laughs> logged in and forwarded them. Um, not my customer until I did the forensics. Now he's my customer. And um, now he's got passwords. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're not on public IPs. Uh, so they went back to Simple Signal, said, no, we're not paying you. Uh, they cut them off. Simple Signal then negotiated a reduced amount that was slightly less than half. Global Star would not engage in a conversation about it. Too bad. Um, the fraud there was that um, basically when they uh, somebody is selling the six six dollars a minute call for three dollars a minute, but they're making the, the call through a through a packed system. Yeah. Uh, and keeping the three bucks. Um, there was one that was all Caribbean uh, premium pay numbers, basically a nine seven six number, but in the Caribbean, the Caribbean does not care about us. They have no <laughs> desire to uh, stop fraud because they're ma all making money on it. Uh, government, everybody else. So there was absolutely nothing that the carriers could do from this side. And that, that was involved AT&T, and they didn't have the power to back charge. So, and then the other one was similar. Um, the, I forgot what country, but they just didn't care. Yeah. Okay. And you had something to contribute to that? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, pardon me for just, I, I had to step out for a few minutes, but what you're describing, the essence of fraud attacks, what you're describing is, pardon the expression, stupidity. Okay, if the client, if the customer is an idiot, we can't stop them from being an idiot. This is one of the things about a couple of years ago we were talking about inside an ARI panel about security inside ARI. And unfortunately, stupid customers will be stupid customers. But the main problem is the following. SIP as a protocol is inherently insecure. This is how it was designed, because it was designed inside what we call a democratic system, which is the internet. It is the, governed by the IETF, when you think about it. It's a, it is a public RFC, and by default, it is insecure. 
Now, the only way companies can prevent such issues of, ex of happening is to not only secure themselves at the transport layer, mainly firewalls and encryption and privacy, which is kind of redundant of saying because we're all doing it, but even then, that is not enough. SIP, as a protocol, is easily replayable. It is easily uh, transcoded. It is easily decipherable. It doesn't take much for somebody, for a man in the middle attack, to take a SIP session and simply replay it over and over and over again. We've seen it over the course of the past 10 years. How many times have you seen that? No, Dozens Couldn't of times. Couldn't even count, yeah. Okay, everybody believes that the vendors are immune. Everybody believes that if you're using Cisco Call Manager, you're immune. If you're using Avaya, you're immune. Nobody's immune because we all use the same thing. In order to change things, we as a community on one hand of technical people should look at the problem and say we need to figure out a way to go beyond our normal measures of securing it because it's not only a VPN and it's not only a firewall and methodologies of leasing a server in the cloud or leasing a physical server from a hardware as a service provider will not help us. We need to change the way we think. For example, one of the things we've done in our platform, we've actually done away with SIP registrations. There are no SIP registrations on our platform. There are no, all the entire mechanism of that work, we changed it. Why? Because it's inherently insecure and it works differently. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do it because you need a special way, a special mechanism and a special solution to do that. But you can do something very similar between your interconnects. If you see a call coming into your PBX in such a way that it's not supposed to come in and it's not authorized the right way, just, just let, don't let it go. But because every, all, everybody here is thinking, oh, I'll just set a back-to-back -back SIP trunk. It comes from an IP. It should work. No, you cannot trust that IP. That IP is there, but it should not be trusted. We're now moving from IPv4 to IPv6. How many of you have, have IPv6 links? One, two, three people, four people. What? Every Verizon, every T-Mobile. Can you support IPv6? IPv6 completely uh, exposes your system to the world. No firewalls, no nothing. You have to take care of yourself because there are literally no providers out there that do it for you. So you have to look at the problem differently. Not only fraud, fraud is a problem. Hacking is a problem. But the problem is not with the hackers, and it's not with the protocol, and it's not with the servers or the networks. We are the problem. Because 99% of us are too lazy to do something about it. And this is the truth. You need to realize it. I know that Duvit wanted to say something. I just want to say, I do a lot of analytics on fraud, and when things happen, we listen to a lot of calls. And there were actually calls where when you called up, instead of having a basic IVR, the IVR actually said, you're doing an awesome job, you're making a lot of money, the longer you stay on the line, the more money you're going to make. And that, that was the kicker, it actually played it back to the caller over and over and over again. And then what they'll do is they'll make a second call and transfer it, so it's off your PBX, you're not even seeing the call anymore, your carrier is seeing it, but... Us as the carrier, we saw, we saw that audio playing back in, as what Nir said. Pe pe people use NAT for security and never learn security, and V6 is here. All your devices are going to be in V6, so learn security and learn how to lock down your systems. I'll talk about that in a bit. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, are we dead on time, or do we have one more question? There was one in the back. Nope, Anyone no more. No. Anything else? All right, guys. Thank you so much. So, Thank you all. Oh, last sure. comment. They want us to tell you all to go to the app and rate everybody because everything these days has a satisfaction survey requirement. Mm -hmm. <laughs>